All right, students, this video is the part two video uh, about chapter nine, which deals with Lewis theory. So let's get into it. There's really two kind of major topics that I need to cover to complete the chapter. Um, the first is bond polarity and electronegativity, and the second is resonance and formal charge. So I'll just take one thing at a time and do my best to explain it. All of this is in your reading, so if you find that you're learning better from the textbook, by all means use the textbook. It's perfect. Um, so anyways, let's get started. Uh, bond polarity. and electronegativity. Two related concepts that we can only now talk about um, now that we have introduced Lewis theory. I'm gonna get my best marker here. All right, to explain this concept of bond polarity and electronegativity, I wanna um, use three molecules and kind of look at what's happening with the molecules to explain. I think it's the best way to do it. So let's go ahead and contrast these three molecules. Let's look at F2, which is a molecule that actually we have already done together. Let's look at HF. That's a good marker. HF. And let's look at NAS. All righty. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the Lewis structures for all three molecules. And from here on out, like I said, I want you to use the, the technique that I taught in the last video that you can use for any, any um, Lewis structure. So F2, okay, so what we want to do is arrange the atoms. There's two fluorine, so you just put them right next to each other. Um, then count the total number of valence electrons in the whole molecule. Two fluorine to each giving you seven, that's 14. Divide by two to get the number of pairs, that's seven pairs. Connect the atoms together with a, with a single bond. Next step is assign remaining pairs as lone pairs to the terminal atoms. This, um, this is a diatomic molecule, so it doesn't even have a central atom. And you just keep assigning until you run out of pairs. So we've used all seven pairs. And as long as you've used all your pairs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and every atom is satisfied, octet on him, octet on him, then your Lewis structure is done. So that's the Lewis structure for fluorine. Now, for this explanation, I do want to go back and instead of using the, the dash to indicate the, um, the shared pair of electrons. Let me go back and put dots, even though we don't usually do that, but for what I'm about to explain, I, I think I'd like to go back to kind of reminding everybody that that dash represents two shared electrons um, in the internuclear space. All right, so let's just stay on this molecule for a minute here. The question is very logical that I'm about to pose. Um, what I wanna ask is which atom, this fluorine or this fluorine, which atom pulls on those electrons harder. Okay, so what you wanna do is imagine the tug of war where you've got one person on one side and one person on the other side pulling on a rope with the flag you know, in the, in the tug of war. That's really kind of a good way of thinking about um, this concept that I'm, that I'm trying to explain here. Who's pulling harder, uh, left guy or right guy? And the answer is they're pulling with the same strength. So how do I, how, how can I say that so confidently? Remember, electrons are negative, okay? So what's actually doing the pulling? A lot of times when people look at a Lewis structure, they forget that inside of every atom is a nucleus. So let's talk about who is actually pulling on the electrons. Well, it's the protons within the nucleus. Protons are positive, and they're attracting those negative electrons towards themselves. So let's talk about the nucleus, because this is gonna um, be important to understanding this concept. How many protons are in a fluorine nucleus? Protons. And if you have your periodic table, you'll know that fluorine is atomic number nine. So fluorine's uh, nucleus is a nine plus nucleus. Let me just write nine plus. In there, in that fluorine atom is a nine plus nucleus, nine positive charges. But so is this fluorine. And that's why I'm saying a nine plus um, nucleus will pull just as hard as a nine plus nucleus. And if they're both pulling with the same strength on those two um, 
electrons in the middle. What you have here is called equal sharing of electrons. And when you have equal sharing, in other words, the electrons lie literally right in the middle of the two atoms because they're being pulled both sides with the same amount of strength. Um, this is what we call a pure, sometimes known as a nonpolar, those would be synonyms, covalent bond. Covalent meaning sharing. So pure sharing, equal sharing of electrons because of the, the fact that you've got the same atoms doing the pulling. Let's go ahead, though, and contrast that to the next molecule, HF. Let's go ahead and do our um, Lewis structure, H and F. So we've got H and F. Second step is total number of valence electrons. So hydrogen gives us one, fluorine gives us seven. That's eight total. That equals four pairs. Connect them together is step one. Now start assigning lone pairs to the terminal atoms. Um, and the whole goal is to satisfy them. Now I'm not gonna add any lone pairs to hydrogen because hydrogen is satisfied already with that because he has a duet. Hydrogen only wants a duet, which is two electrons and he's already satisfied. So fluorine is where I'm gonna go ahead and start satisfying with my remaining pairs. And this Lewis structure is done. I've used all the pairs and every atom is satisfied. Him with a duet and him with an octet. All right, so now coming back to the same question. Actually, you know what? Let me go back in and instead of the dash, just to remember, because sometimes people get kind of like, they forget what they're looking at here. That dash represents two shared electrons. So now let's ask the same question here about H and F. Once again, use the tug of war analogy. Who is pulling tighter, hydrogen or fluorine? Well, who's doing the pulling is the nuclei. Fluorine, once again, has a nine plus nucleus. A nine plus nucleus in his, in the center of his, of that atom is, are nine protons. How many protons are in a hydrogen nucleus? One. Hydrogen only has one proton doing the pulling. So you are essentially doing a tug of war between someone who has a one positive charge and someone who has a nine positive charge. Who's going to win that tug of war? Who's pulling harder? Well, hopefully you can see. It actually relates to something called Coulomb's law, but the greater the magnitude of your charge, the more attraction you're going to get. Um, but just use your common sense. Wouldn't nine protons be pulling harder? And they certainly do. Well, those, it's the similar, the, you know, that's my little flag in my tug of war. Essentially what that means is that since fluorine pulls tighter, those two electrons are not in the center of those two atoms. They're actually shifted towards the, the atom pulling tighter. And so true, you, you actually could think of it like this. They truly are, the electron density is shifted towards the fluorine and away from the hydrogen. Now, this is not how most people, uh, oh, let me back up for a minute. What is that called when you have unequal sharing? So that in this case, we have unequal sharing of electrons. Unequal sharing of electrons. This type of bond, it's still sharing, but it's not, it's not equal sharing. And what we do is we call that a polar covalent bond a polar covalent bond, when the two atoms pull with significantly different strengths. All right, now, um, this is not how most people would represent a polar covalent bond. Let me show you how it is represented. There's really two ways. Let me go back to just drawing the regular Lewis structure. When you have this kind of uneven sharing, there's two ways that people do it. The way that I usually do it is whatever atom is pulling harder, and I'm gonna give you a way to kind of determine that more um, distinctly in just a minute. But for now, you just think about fluorine with his nine protons versus hydrogen with his one. Fluorine does pull harder. Um, whoever, whatever atom pulls harder, he is gonna get on his side what's called a partial negative. It's kind of like a, like a lowercase d with a little bit of curve to it. Um, negative, and that means partial, it's a partial charge 
A partial charge is basically, you're not talking about like an ion. It doesn't have a full um, charge, like a one minus or a two minus charge. It's almost like a fraction of a charge. Essentially what it means is that the negativity um, of those electrons has shifted this way and wherever they go, there goes your negative charge. And in some ways it's even easier to see over here. Um, you'll have a partial positive on the hydrogen. Because remember, hydrogen has his one proton in the middle. So if all the negativity is shifted away from him, he's, he's kind of positive over here. Now, it's not that the electrons have totally transferred. That's why it's not a full charge, but they've shifted away. And so bottom line is whatever atom pulls harder, you write partial negative. Whatever atom pulls less hard, you write partial positive. That's one way to indicate a polar covalent bond, like an uneven sharing. The other way is to use a vector, and a lot of people do use this. And what you would do is draw an arrow pointing to the more negative, um, the negative side, or where, whatever atom is pulling harder. Really, one of those two ways is sufficient to indicate a polar covalent bond, unequal sharing of electrons. Alrighty, now let's go ahead and move on to this last molecule, NAF. Now this one is different because unlike these two, which are two nonmetals bound together, H and F are nonmetals, and of course F and F are, Na and F are um, a metal and a nonmetal. So right off the bat, we already kind of know that this is um, going to be an ionic bond, but let's go ahead and analyze it using Lewis theory. Na has a single valence electron. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. So this one I'm analyzing kind of from the point of view that it's an ionic compound. Okay, seven valence electrons. And what we know based on what we talked about last time is that this, um, this is not a sharing situation. These two atoms are not going to share these two electrons. Okay, um, instead the sodium is going to end up being um, more stable if he just gives away his electron, and that's exactly what, what he does. It's not sharing at all. This is a transfer of electrons, and the result is that the sodium will end up having a positive charge because he transferred his electrons fully, unlike these two, which are sharing them in the middle. Um, this one is fully transferring it, and the fluorine accepts it, the electron. Both of them become... Um, get that noble gas configuration when they undergo this business transaction. And thus, you have the result, which is um, what we call an ionic bond. An ionic bond is, is simply just the attraction of a positive cation to a negative anion. That's all an ionic bond is. You have a positive cation and a negative anion, and they're going to be attracted to each other because of that electrostatic attraction. So you see that this is a different situation than the covalent bonds. Um, so essentially what I've done is introduce this new kind of DD, uh, this new um, split in covalent covalency between nonpolar and polar. Now, why is it called polar? Polar just means that you have a, um, a negative side and a positive side. That's when we do chapter 10, we'll be able to take this all the way into understanding whether a molecule is polar. This is just whether a bond is polar, looking at a specific bond and asking if there's a difference in the pull. Um, but basically, it's just means polar just means one of the sides is negative, one of the sides is positive. The east is different from the west, or you know, the north is different from the south. That's kind of what polar means. You've got a, kind of these um these different different um charges on either side of the bond, even if they're partial charges. Okay, so now getting into, so that's what we mean by bond polarity. Now getting into the concept of electronegativity. I have, for the sake of teaching this, oversimplified a little bit the discussion of why fluorine pulls harder than hydrogen. I made it all about number of protons. And certainly that does play a huge part in it. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that um, because how tightly an atom pulls on bonded electrons is not just influenced by the number of protons. Otherwise, the, you know, the largest element in your periodic table 
um, whatever it is, number 114 or whatever it is, 116 would be the, would be the one that pulls the hardest and that's not the case. Um, it has also to do with, with the, the atomic size or the atomic radius. So it's a little bit complicated um, and different, um, there's different influences over it. So what I need to introduce now is this topic of electronegativity. So electronegativity, let me go ahead and just kind of um, give you a definition for electronegativity is um, essentially a measure of how um, I guess we could use the word tightly, how tightly a bonding or a um, an atom pulls on its bonding electrons. So the only context that you even talk about electronegativity is within a bond, okay? So a bond is always between two atoms, this one and that one. Electronegativity is basically a measure of who's pulling harder, okay? Um, the measure of how tightly an atom pulls on its bonding electrons. And let me go ahead and give you a couple things about it. It is related to number of protons. which is essentially just the nuclear charge, but also um, atomic radius. Because with a really large atom, even if you have a, like a, a lot of protons in your nucleus, they're really far away from the thing you're trying to pull, so its, it's effect is less. So it's, um, it's related to these things. At the end of the day, it's not something that you're going to have to calculate because um, there is something called the Pauling Electronegative, electronegativity scale, which you can look up online, or it's in your textbook. Let me go ahead and tell you what top, what page to be looking at. It's in chapter nine. Looks like a periodic table. It's like a colorful periodic table. Uh, figure nine point eight. Looks like that. They just call it trends in electronegativity, but officially it is called the Pauling electronegativity scale. Let me go ahead and give you that figure 9.8. And in figure 9.8, what you're looking at is essentially the scores for all the different atoms on the periodic table. And it's basically telling you who pulls the hardest. Now, um, it's, it's not... It's not supposed to necessarily be related to a grade point average, but as you know, you know, a really good student, kind of the, the top that you should, you know, that you can get is a 4.0. I mean, I know they go higher, but 4.0 is like the best. And that's kind of how you can think about it with um, the electronegativity scale. If you hunt on this little chart here, you will find that the atom with a 4.0 is fluorine. Fluorine has a 4.0, and in fact, that's higher than anybody else. What that's telling you is that fluorine, out of all the elements on the periodic table, pulls the hardest. And that does relate to the fact that he is two things. He does have a lot of protons, um, you know, compared to the guys to his, to his left in his period, but he's also very small compared to the guys that are lower than him. So he is close to the bonds because his, his nucleus is not that far away because it's a small atom and he has kind of a lot of protons in that nucleus. So um, anyhow, so that's why fluorine is the most. So according to the Pauline electronegativity scale, let's just draw a little thing for your notes. You will have access to these numbers when you, when you do your exam. I mean, you can look them up in this table. You can look them up online, but I do want you to know, and everybody should know if they pass chemistry, that fluorine is unique in that he is the most electronegative atom. In other words, any time he is in a competition with any other atom, he wins. He's pulling harder. Now, the only exception to that is if the other guy is a fluorine, then they would pull equally. But it's like, it's like the strength of the pull. So fluorine is the most electronegativity, electronegative atom. And then as you notice on your table, really electronegativity increases almost like on the diagonal as you get to fluorine. Um, 
In fact, there's one corner of the periodic table that most people would just kind of remember. It's the purple corner right there. These are fairly electronegative atoms. They're fairly high. Fluorine is king. Picture um, oxygen being queen, nitrogen being the jack if you're playing cards or whatever, in terms of first, second, and third place. So maybe for your notes, what I would write is something like this. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Oxygen is second place, and nitrogen is third place. And then chlorine and bromine kind of like honorable mention. They're, they're pretty electronegative as well compared to the other atoms. So um, the way that this works is, let me make sure I'm telling you everything I want to say about that. Okay, the way that this works is you can use these scores, these Pauling electronegativity scores in the, in the scale to determine um, the bond polarity of any bond. So what we do, let's go ahead and put this in your notes here. There is a um, continuum. Okay, so this is another thing where we kind of, um, scientists, the farther you get in science, you realize that everything's a continuum. It's much more gray than sometimes you're originally taught to believe. So there's a continuum. Maybe go ahead and put this on the board first and then I'll explain it. Um, so if you do 0 and 0 0.4, and then 0 0.4 to 2.0, and then 2.0 to 3.3. I keep trying to find a great marker, and I'm not happy with the ones I keep choosing. But anyhow, um, what you are building here with me in your notes is how to use what's called the delta EN. The delta to EN is simply this, the difference. Usually delta means change, but here we mean difference in the difference in the electronegativity scores between the two atoms that you're kind of examining. You're going to calculate that, and I'll show you with some examples. And then you're going to place the difference in electronegativity scores somewhere on this continuum. If your answer falls between 0 and 0 0.4, this is what scientists would call a pure or nonpolar covalent bond. Kind of like my first example of the F2, pure or nonpolar covalent bond. It doesn't have to be exactly the same um, atom, like fluorine, fluorine, to uh, fall in this category. It just has to be somewhere between 0 and 0 0.4 um, for scientists to kind of be like, okay, we're going to call that a pure nonpolar uh, non covalent bond. If you're between 0 0.4 and 2.0, this is what scientists would call a polar covalent bond. But even that, there's a continuum. If you're in this area here, you're polar, yes, but you're not as polar as you are up here. So really, with as you move to the right, you are increasing in polarity, which means the difference between your partial positive and partial negative side is big. They're, they're farther and farther away. This ends up being very important in concepts like boiling point and phases and phase changes and things like that, volatility, things that come in um, Chem 102. So understanding polarity becomes pretty important, um, hugely important in organic chemistry uh, and, and frankly in biochemistry, majorly important. So polar covalent bond in this area, but the farther you go this way, you're increasing in how polar you are. And then if you are in this section of the, of the continuum, scientists would deem you an ionic bond. So let's go ahead and do some practice here. Let's go ahead and ask this question here. Could you please um, tell me what type of bond is a nitrogen to oxygen bond? Nitrogen and oxygen, whether it's single, double, triple, it doesn't really matter. But if you have a nitrogen and oxygen bond, um, is it pure, nonpolar, covalent, polar covalent, or ionic? How are we going to do that? You're going to look up your scores on your, just your, your electro electronegativity, electronegativity scores. Nitrogen scores a 3.0. Oxygen scores a 3.5. So this is a measure of how hard they pull. This is their electronegativity scores. So oxygen does pull harder. 
Um, but what we want to do is we want to calculate the delta En. What is the delta En for that bond? And we just take the smaller, or take the bigger minus the smaller. We don't want negative numbers. Just get the bigger one, subtract the smaller one, and you will get a delta En of 0.5. That's the difference in their pull. And that places it right about here. The nitrogen-oxygen bond is polar covalent. And that's what you would say. Now, who pulls harder? How could you um, diagram that if you're trying to kind of write it on a Lewis structure or something? You would have the partial negative charge near the oxygen. So you would write it like this because he's the one who pulls harder. And the partial positive would be who, whoever pulls less. All right, let's go ahead and look at another bond. Let's look at the um, bond between calcium and bromine. Now, I'm going to do this for now just to represent a bond in general. Usually, we save that only for covalent bonds. But let me just use that just to talk about the calcium and bromine bond. Chances are it's going to be ionic because you have a metal and a nonmetal. But this is how you officially decide what type of bond is between two atoms. That's where we kind of blow a little bit of what, we, what we've been using all semester out of the water. We used to just say metal, nonmetal, ionic. But really, this is how it's done. So calcium scores a 1.0. Bromine scores a 2.8. The delta En would be 1.8. And oh, here we go. Perfect example. Um, calcium is 1.0. Bromine is 2.8. Yeah, the difference is 1.8. So the calcium bromine bond is actually technically, according to this scale, a polar covalent bond. And here's the thing. It's like, obviously bromine's winning, right? It's like that, it's kind of like a understanding this gray area. Calcium pretty much has transferred his electron to bromine. It's an almost transfer, because notice it's almost ionic. But it's kind of a little bit in the internuclear space as well. See, it's, it's this continuum. It's not so clear cut as, you know, calcium loses. Um, and I know I'm talking about, I know calcium's a two plus and all that, but that's kind of the reality of it. It's this, it's this um, continuum. It kind of blows a little bit out of the water. It, everything is a sliding scale as the level of transfer, with ionic being kind of what we would deem full transfer. So if, if I asked you to use the Pauling electronegativity scores, you would have to call calcium bromine bond a polar covalent bond, now very polar covalent, almost ionic. That's kind of how you would say that. Let's go ahead and do a couple more. Let's do CH because this is such an important bond in chemistry. Anytime you have a hydrocarbon, and frankly, any um, organic molecule, you're going to have carbon to hydrogen bonds. Let's look at the scores. Carbon, 2.5. Hydrogen, 2.1. So the delta En is 0 0.4. Now, I will tell you, even though this lies right on the edge, um, pretty much everybody in science chemistry deems a CH bond pure covalent or nonpolar. Okay, that's kind of accepted. So yes, it's right on the border, but most people would call that a nonpolar. That's quite a famous uh, and important concept. CH bonds are nonpolar. Um, and let's, how about we just do one more? Let's go for something like NaCl, um, NaCl. Sodium chloride, okay, so sodium is 0 0.9. Chlorine, 3.0. The delta En between them is 2.1. And that would be safely within the ionic description of the bond, which is what we've kind of assumed all this time with sodium chloride. The reason it stops at 3.3, maybe you've already noticed this, but 
If you look at for the highest number, it's 4.0 with fluorine. If you look for the smallest number on your scale, you're going to find that it's cesium and franconium are both 0 0.7. So 4.0 minus 0 0.7 is 3.3. The maximum difference that could be observed with the known elements is 3.3. So that's why it ends with 3.3. So essentially, know how to use these Pauline electronegativity scores to place a particular bond okay, within these three categories um, and understand the significance of what electronegativity means. It's the, the ability or how hard or how tightly you are pulling on your bonding electrons. Fluorine being O is the winner. Okay, so that puts us, gets us through bond polarity and electronegativity. And now we can move on to the last concept of chapter nine that I'd like to cover which is resonance and formal charge. Resonance and formal charge. And once again, these two are also related. Resonance and formal charge. Okay, so let's go ahead and kind of explain this again, almost like, like I'm telling you a story or whatever. Um, here's the key point. For some molecules, there is only one possible Lewis structure. Now, what do we mean by possible? Remember when I said how to know you're done with your Lewis structure, you had to ask two questions. The first question was you have to use all your pairs. Did you use all your pairs? The second question is, are, is every atom satisfied? That's what makes your Lewis structure a good Lewis structure or correct Lewis structure. And sometimes you'll get a molecule where there's just one answer. There's just only one possible answer. Um, for instance, um, oh wait, let me write this first. Possible meaning you could say yes to using all your pairs and yes to satisfying all atoms. So the example that I have is um, C2H2. So go ahead and draw C2H2's Lewis structure. Let me help you out a little bit with this one. We haven't done a ton of Lewis structures, so sometimes there's just like little bits of tips that I can give along the way. If your molecule has multiple carbons in it, always connect the carbons together. So the carbons are going to be connected together. And then hydrogen can never be connected to multiple things. So that's why hydrogen has to be terminal. Hydrogen always has to be hanging off the side of a Lewis structure because it can only form one bond because it can only make a, a duet. So that really kind of tells you where the hydrogens need to be always on the periphery of the Lewis structure. So C2H2, that's me arranging the atoms. Um, let's count all the pairs. Okay, carbon, there's two of them. Four valence electrons each plus two hydrogens, one of uh, valence electron each. Two plus eight is ten. Ten divided by, oops, ten divided by two is five. Five pairs. Um, connect all the atoms together. Okay, so I'm just following my rules. The next step is assign lone pairs to your terminal atoms first satisfying them, and then you get to move into the central atom. Well, these terminal atoms are already satisfied. Let me go ahead and just follow my rules here. I'm going to start assigning lone pairs. So I have now, I have to stop now because I've used five pairs. However, not every atom is satisfied. You can see this carbon is, but this carbon is not. So the next step said, if you run out of pairs, you need to form double bonds or triple bonds as necessary to basically reassign your pair so that they're serving multiple atoms. So I'm going to reassign him, and make him serve both carbons. And I'm going to reassign him, and make him serve both carbons. And now you have your Lewis structure completed. Five pairs have been used, and every atom has satisfied. He has a duet. This carbon has an octet. That's four pairs. So does this carbon, and then this hydrogen has a duet. So here's the thing, there's no other possible drawing that will suffice to answer these two questions for this molecule. That's what I'm saying, there's, for some molecules, there's only one possible Lewis structure. However, 
that's not always the case. And in fact, it's often not times the case. All right, so continuing on, um, I got cut off from the last one, but this just continues on. So unlike that molecule C2H2, which we just drew where there's only one possible Lewis structure, for some molecules, there are multiple possible Lewis structures. All right, and what do I, once again, what do I mean by possible? You can draw multiple Lewis structures that say yes to both questions. They all use all the pairs and they um, satisfy every atom. So that is what we're getting into with this concept of resonance. Let's go ahead and give an example of this situation. Um, let's use the molecule NO2 minus, which is the nitrite anion, okay? NO2 minus, let's draw the Lewis structure together and you'll, hopefully you can see as we're, sometimes this doesn't get revealed, it only gets revealed while you're drawing the Lewis structure. So let me explain. And this is why it's so very important that you use the techniques and the methodology that I've taught you, because this will help you see the resonance structures um, much better than trying to, you know, just um, willy-nilly your, your Lewis structures. So let's go ahead and follow our technique here. Arrange the atoms on paper. So that means nitrogen is going to be in the center. He is, you know, the only one you have one of. He's the first atom listed. And by the way, one of the things I did say earlier was the first atom, the central atom, is usually your least electronegative atom. Well, now we know what that is, and that's true. Nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. Okay, so then let's go ahead and put our oxygens um, on either side. Um, Yeah, one other thing I didn't mention, what, well, I'll, I'll leave that alone. So anyway, let's leave that there. Um, okay, so next step is get your total number of electron pairs, of, of va sorry, yeah. Get your total number of valence electrons and divide by two. So nitrogen of five, oxygen, there's two of them, they each give us six. We are gonna have to add one extra electron for that negative charge. So five plus 12 is 17 plus one, 18, divided by two is nine pairs. Nine pairs is what I have to work with. So now I connect my atoms together. Then I assign lone pairs to my terminal atoms first. Satisfying them. Let's see where I am. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've used eight, I've got one more, so now he can go on the central atom. So everything is lone pairs until you run out of pairs. So I now have nine pairs, and now I ask my two questions. Did you use all your pairs? Yes. However, is every atom satisfied? The answer to that is no. The oxygens are good. Okay, the oxygens are good. They both have octets. The nitrogen is not. Now, here's where the alternate resonance or the alternate Lewis structures come into play. Anytime you are forming a double bond, right, and you have a choice of whether you're going to pick from one atom or the other atom, which is what you have here. Like I could pick from this oxygen or this oxygen. You are actually going to be able to draw what are called resonance structures. Resonance structures are simply alternate forms of the Lewis structure that, that are possible for the, for the um, molecule. So let me go ahead and illustrate. If I pull from this oxygen to make my double bond, I have a good Lewis structure. Well, I will as soon as I finish this and put the negative charge on the outside. However, so that's a good Lewis structure, okay? Um, however, if I had, let me kind of recreate that place where I was at just a second ago. This is where I was just a second ago with my nine pairs. If I had pulled from this oxygen to make my double bond, I have what's called a, another Lewis structure, another possible Lewis structure. And what these are called, let me go ahead and give you that terminology. These are called, you would say you, this, you would say that this molecule has two different resonance structures, resonance structures. They're essentially alternate forms of Lewis structures. of possible Lewis structures. 
And what makes them possible is just that you use all your pairs and every atom is satisfied. But they are different than each other. Okay, one of them has the, di um, the double bond there. The other one has the double bond there. So that's what it means to have a resonance structure. You can have two different forms. Now, here's the thing about this molecule. Remember, Lewis theory is just a theory trying to understand a real molecule that really exists. Here's the, the issue with this molecule. We know from, from data that this bond, or sorry, that this molecule is, um, has two bonds that are equal in length. Okay? We're actually going to learn in Chapter 10 that they're going to bend down like that. But don't worry about that for now. What I do want you to make a point of in your notes is that the real molecule has bonds that are equal in length. That's important for you to understand. And we know that from data, okay? There's ways that we can measure the bond length or like the distance between the two atoms. We know that the real molecules, that the two nitrogen oxygen bonds are exactly the same length as each other. What that means is really significant. That means that this Lewis structure is actually not correct. Neither is this Lewis structure. It is not correct because both of them indicate a shorter bond and a longer bond. Remember, double bonds are shorter, um, single bonds are longer. This one would be lopsided or um, asymmetrical in terms of the bond length, but so would this one. So, so what good are they? What good are they? Well, the reality is the real molecule this is very conceptual, but it's also very kind of common sense. The real molecule is what we would call a mix between the two resonance structures. And what we call that, the real molecule, you would call a resonance hybrid. Hybrid meaning... Um, hybrid meaning mixture. So the way that scientists depict that is they would draw both resonance structures and they would put a double arrow in between them. And that's how you would represent the resonance hybrid um, trying to depict the real molecule. And people who know chemistry, which includes you now, would understand that the, that this, um, that this, that like, for instance, this bond here is neither a double nor is it a single bond. It's like a one and a half bond in terms of length and strength. And so is this one. It's not a single, it's not a double. It's like a one and a half bond in terms of length and strength. Um, and one more thing I'll have you write in your notes. So the real molecule is a mixture or a mix between the two resonance structures. And we call that the resonance hybrid, which really is this whole thing. That's how you would depict the resonance hybrid. And essentially, the way scientists would describe this is the electrons are delocalized um, along the molecule. So, a little bit hard to see, but let's give it a try here. This um, second double bond here and this one here, as well as this double bond here and this one here, they're not really here nor there. They're essentially, essentially like spread out along the molecule, spread out along the molecule. And that's what it means to mix the two together. The electrons are kind of spread apart, spread out, and it makes the molecule symmetrical. It's actually not a perfect theory. Um, there are kind of better theories that have replaced it, but it's still used a lot in chemistry. It's, you know, it helps to us to understand molecules. So that's what it means to be, have to have resonance. Um, let us go ahead and look at one more. Oh, actually, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, as I'm erasing that, 
I want you to notice for the one that I just erased, okay, some technical difficulties today. What I was saying is the one that I just erased, the two resonance structures that I drew were simply like mirror images of each other. It's like one was, if you flipped it around, it was, it, it was just a mirror image. Technically, there are two different Lewis structures and they are two different resonance structures, but they were just mirror images. So what that means is that the hybrid is like a 50-50 mix between the two. It's um, both of them contribute equally. If you were to think of like a weighted average, they both carry equal weight to what the real molecule is. And that's why the molecule ends up being symmetrical. However, um, for some molecules, let me go ahead and this is really like the last point here. For some molecules, um, uh, the resonance structures are unequal. And by when I say unequal, I essentially mean not, they're not just mirror images. And one of them contributes more to the resonance hybrid. And the one that contributes more would be deemed the best or most significant Lewis structure. Or resonance structure. So it's a little bit a little bit um, conceptual, and I get that. But with an example, hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and use, um, let me see which one I want to do first. Let's go ahead and use this one. So there's a molecule called um, HCN. HCN. And I'm going to go ahead and give you two Lewis structures that both satisfy the rules and therefore they're, they pass the test of being resonance structures or good Lewis structures. So one of them is where the H, the CN are kept in their same order as listed. And I'm just gonna, for the sake of time, go ahead and just draw the Lewis structure. You could check it yourself um, with in terms of the number of pairs and all that, but that's one of the Lewis structures that could be drawn. Another Lewis structure that could be drawn would have the nitrogen in the center. And I know I said that that usually it does keep the order, but technically this is an alternate Lewis structure for that same molecule because all it really has to do is have H, C, and N in it. And with this one, okay, with this one, you don't just have a mirror image. You truly have a different um, even arrangement of the atoms. It's not just a mirror image. So they're, they're not equal Lewis structures in that sense. They're, they're considered unequal. They're, they're not just a mirror image. All right. So what I'm telling you is that one of them is more true to the true molecule. It um, more accurately represents what that molecule looks like. If you could see it with a microscope, it more accurate, re accurately represents it. So how are we to tell which one is the best Lewis structure? So this is the type of thing that you would have to do on the exam, and I'm going to ask you a question kind of like this. I would give you two competing Lewis structures. And so that wouldn't be your re responsibility to necessarily, you know, draw them yourselves. I would give it to you. Um, you would have to determine, and I would ask you, which one is the best Lewis structure? Well, let me go ahead and give you how you're going to figure it out. The best Lewis structure will be the one with the least amount of what we call formal charge. Formal charge. So now we're getting to this last concept. Like I said, these are related, resonance and formal charge. It will be the one that has the least amount of formal charge. So let's go ahead and first... Um, Let's go ahead and detail what formal charge is. Another concept that's very big in chemistry, big in organic chemistry. Formal charge is, is a, uh, it's kind of a hypothetical that scientists use, but basically it's the charge an atom would have if
if um, the shared electrons were um, split evenly between the two atoms. Okay, that's essentially uh, the two the two bonded atoms. If you want to write the word bonded to make it a little bit more clear, that's what formal charge is. So it's the charge an atom would have if. Um, the shared electrons were completely split. Okay, so anytime you have a bond, remember it's two electrons, you give one to one atom and one to the other atom. Now the way that I'd like you to do this on the exam, and I'm gonna actually require that you do do it this way, because part of what I'm um, making sure is that you're learning, you know, actually learning the material um, and not just Googling it, okay, because a, a lot of the stuff can be found online and I get that. Um, but you have to prove that you're actually learning it. And plus I know that this is a really good way, and so I want you to do it this way. Um, it's the way that my teacher taught me in my Chem 101 class many years ago. To calculate formal charge, what I always do is I draw a circle around every atom. Formal charge is something that you will calculate for every atom. Every single atom gets its own formal charge. And the circle should bisect the bonds. So literally go straight through the bonds. So you're going to enclose every atom, but you're going to bisect the bonds. Or dissect, I don't know what right what the word is. So a circle around every atom. Okay. This is not how the book has you do it, but it gets you the same answer, so I think it's a nice way to do it. Eventually you can do it with your eyes, but on the test or whatever, I'd like you to circle it. All right, so how do you calculate formal charge? It's a very simple subtraction problem. What you want to do is Next to or underneath every atom, you want to write the number of valence electrons that the atom should have according to the periodic table. So according to the periodic table, hydrogen should have one valence electron, carbon should have four, and nitrogen should have five. Okay, basically the group number. And from that, you are going to subtract another number. So just a tiny little subtraction problem. You're going to subtract the number of electrons in the circle. Because if you think about it, it does actually use this rule. I'm essentially taking those shared electrons and I'm giving one of them to the hydrogen. That's why I cut the circle in half. So that dash, remember, the dash represents two electrons. So half of the dash is one. So there's one electron in hydrogen circle. And that means he has a formal charge of zero. See, the end result is the, is the formal charge. Carbon, how many um, electrons are in his circle? Well, one, two, three, four, because a half of a dash is one. So one, two, three, four. He also has a formal charge of zero. Nitrogen, one, two, three, and then four, five. See, he's going to get both of his lone pairs because they're not bonding. So one, two, three, four, five. So nitrogen has a formal charge of zero. So in this resonance structure, this form, this alternate Lewis structure, all of the atoms have a zero formal charge. Let's go ahead and look at this resonance structure. All right, same thing. First number is just straight from the periodic table. One, five, four. And from that, you're going to subtract the number of electrons in the circle. So hydrogen has one electron in his circle. He's formal charge of zero. Nitrogen, one, two, three, four. Nitrogen has a formal charge of plus one. And it's a charge, so it's not just one, it's plus one, it's a charge. And then carbon, one, two, three, four, five. Carbon has a formal charge of negative one. Now, one thing to check before we um, finish this, this evaluation here. When you add up all the formal charges of the atom, so zero, or sorry, of the molecule, zero, plus one, and negative one. It should equal the charge on the molecule. So HCN is neutral, his formal charges should add up to zero. That's a way for you to check that you're doing it right. If they don't add up to what the charge is on the molecule, you have an error. But now let's go ahead and finish our evaluation here. The best Lewis structure, the one that more accurately represents the real molecule that we cannot see, is the one that has the least amount of formal charge, 
and that is this one. He has the least amount of formal charge. In fact, he has zeros on everybody. Think of formal charge as a bad thing. Atoms don't want formal charge. So if you can draw a Lewis structure that where all of them are a zero, that represents your best Lewis structure, the most accurate or significant. Technically, there is still resonance. This one does contribute to the hybrid, but like, think about 99.9% .9 him, 0.1% him. I mean, I just made that up, but it's very insignificant, so it doesn't really um, describe the molecule. Let's go ahead and do another one. Let's go ahead and do um, carbonate, CO3, 2 minus. Let's first examine, does carbonate have multiple resonance structures, or is there just one Lewis structure that can be drawn? So if you want to pause the video, go ahead and pause it. Go ahead and draw your Lewis structure for carbonate, and I'll start doing mine on the board. Alrighty, so I use my 12 pairs, but not every atom is satisfied. Carbon is not. And like I said, anytime you can pull from like one oxygen or a different one or a different one, you now open the door to different resonance structures. So this is one resonance structure. This is another one where I pull from the top carbon. And my last one would be where I pull from, I, I meant uh, oxygen, where I pull from this oxygen on the right. Okay, so, oh, you know what? Let's be good here. These are ions, so you need to have brackets. So if you were to kind of look up Lewis structures for carbonate, any good website should tell you there are three of them. And um, I guess you could, you would see that there was a, those little kind of arrows that to indicate that the, the true molecule is a mixture of all three, okay? It's not that, um, it's not any one of them. Now, um, to find out which one is best, you would look at the formal charge on all the atoms. So let's go ahead and assign the formal charge. Even when you do one, you'll see it goes pretty fast on all the atoms. So let me just do this one first. So oxygen should have six, and he has six in his circle. So he has a formal charge of zero. Carbon should have four. He has four in his circle. He has a zero. This oxygen should have six, but he has seven in his circle. He's negative one. Oxygen should have six. He has seven in his circle. He's negative one. So in terms of formal charge, with this resonance structure, you've got two zeros and two negative ones. Notice the formal charges add up to the charge on the molecule. If I was to do the formal charge on these two as well. Let me just jump to the final answer. This one would have a negative one. This one would have negative one. This would be zero and zero. And this one would be negative one, zero, zero, and negative one. So you can take your time with it if you want to practice. But at the end of the day, all three of those resonance structures have a negative one charge on an oxygen and a negative one charge on another oxygen. They are all, that's another way of thinking about being equivalent Lewis structures. They're not unequal. They all have the same amount of formal charge, which means when you think about the real molecule, 
It says 33% him, 33% him, 33% him. It's a pure mixture of all three molecules. And what we find out about carbonate is that these three bonds, the C to O bonds, are all equal in length. They're all neither single nor are they double. They're all equal in length. We'll learn about the shape in chapter 10. But the, the molecule is perfectly symmetrical. And so that's um, how you could tell that obviously that you can draw three resonance structures, but the, these ones are all equal because they have the same amount of formal charge. Let's do one more to just nail this point of formal charge down. Formal charge being like the decider, the final arbiter of which Lewis structure is best, or are they all equal contributors to the real molecule? Let's go with this one too, N2O. Di-nitrogen monoxide. Um, at least two Lewis structures. There may be more. I haven't taken the time to draw more, but just at least these two can be drawn for this molecule. This one and this one. So let's just pause for a minute and say, and just kind of do a, a little reality check. Don't just take my word for it. Are these both good Lewis structures? Do they satisfy the requirements of being a Lewis structure, an accurate or a representation of the molecule? All that you have to do is use all your pairs and satisfy every atom. Let's make sure we have all of our pairs up here. Nitrogen, you've got two of them, but they each give you five. Oxygen gives you six, gives you a total of 16. Valence electrons, that's eight pairs. So to be a good Lewis structure, they both have to have eight pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so they both meet that requirement. And um, do they satisfy every atom? He has an octet. 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 Octet meaning eight valence electrons or two, um, sorry, four pairs. So you see what I'm saying? These are two resonance structures. So you have resonance between them. The real molecule would be a, a mixture of both. Is it 50-50? Are they equivalent? Um, or is one like much more true or much more descriptive of the real molecule? And this matters. If it's this one, the real molecule should kind of have these bonds be equal in, in or at least somewhat similar in, in length. And this one should have like a really long bond and a really, really short bond. So there's always data to back up our theories. So let's go ahead and figure out which is the best Lewis structure. That's kind of how the question would, would come. You would have to know that to figure out which one is the best Lewis structure, you have to determine the formal charge on all the atoms. All right, formal charge. First number, periodic table group number. Track from that the number of electrons in the circle. Okay, so I just calculated my formal charges. And so these are all the formal charges. And between the two, you can see that neither of them had all zeros. Anytime you can get all zeros, that's always wins. That always is your best Lewis structure. But there's one more point that we're gonna end on here today, which is informal charge cannot be avoided. In other words, you, for the life of you, can't figure out a Lewis structure, and nobody can, that there's no formal charge on, the, on any of the atoms. And that does happen plenty of times. If formal charge cannot be avoided, then the best Lewis structure, or the best resonance structure, Lewis structure is um, kind of the more general term. Resonance structure is the concept of alternate Lewis structures for the same molecule. The best Lewis structure will have the negative formal charge 
on the more electronegative atom. So with these two Lewis structures, the negative formal charge on this one is on an oxygen, and on this one it's on a nitrogen. We want the negative formal charge to be on the more electronegative atom, which is oxygen. So therefore, according to that um, consideration, this is the best formal charge, the most descriptive of the real molecule, and that is uh, um, what is the word I'm looking for? That's evidenced by, by da data as well. So that is how you use formal charge when you're presented with alternate resonance structures for the same molecule. There is um, examples in the book, other examples. With, with resonance and formal charge, you really just have to dig into it and try to make sure you understand it. And the more examples you do, the better. So just do your homework questions, do your readings, um, and hopefully you will at least get an appreciation for this concept of resonance and formal charge. That is the end of chapter nine. And we will be moving on to chapter 10 next week where we will get into the shapes of the molecules. I've been hinting at it a little bit, um, the molecules shaped like this or whatever. That is the best for theory. So we're gonna learn that next week. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.